I am so glad you convinced me that the family car should be the Defender 110. It is so beautiful inside. It's so comfortable, and it just feels indestructible. Yes, it really is. I've been waiting a long time for the new model to come out. The Defender 110, I'm telling you, it's my favorite car of all times. It's my third one. You know, I have stories of going off-road. The guy managed the group. He was like, what are you doing in this beautiful car? I'm like, I'm going off-road. He's like, are you sure? Because you can use one of ours. And then they look like Mad Max cars. I'm like, no, 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 we're going to do this. And he was shocked. Wow. Well, it's great because the Defender has been reimagined for 21st century adventure and its unparalleled off-road ability as well as its robust interior are invaluable whether you're headed towards uncharted territory or just a weekend of exploration. The Defender 110 tackles challenging surroundings with absolute confidence. The SUV conveys strength outside and in featuring peerless technology like an intuitive driver display and an award-winning infotainment system. That's my favorite part, to keep you connected no matter where the journey takes you. Adventure is unique to everyone, and so is the Defender. Choose from the two-door Defender 90, the four-door Defender 110, or the larger Defender 130 with the ability to seat up to eight passengers. You'll find uncompromising performance in all three. So pack up and go even further with the Defender 110. Learn more at LandRoverUSA.com forward slash Defender. This isn't your average business podcast, and he's not your average host. This is the James Altucher Show on the Choose Yourself Network. Today on the James Altucher Show. How does an artist reinvent? What should they do? It's a bit mysterious, and I think probably... One good way to keep reinventing yourself is not to be too successful, actually. So to feel like you're chasing something all the time that you almost can get but just can't quite get. And then also, it's what goes on inside a person, but I think it's trying to remain open and willing to sort of be astonished by new things and be influenced. Rich Cohen, author of The Sun, The Moon, and The Rolling Stones. Rich, there's so many things I want to talk to you about this book. First, and I'm going to ask you totally basic, naive questions, but then I want to kind of dig into your whole process of writing this book because I read a ton of books about The Rolling Stones. This is the best I've ever read. Who do you like better, The Rolling Stones or The Beatles? The Rolling Stones. I would say (laughs) 75% of the people I ask that question say The Rolling Stones. But I, I just called my business partner. He said The Beatles. And but he he understands the Rolling Stones answer cause just because of the longevity. And I think the Rolling Stones has some songs that are just like un, so unbelievably good it beats all the Beatles songs. But I think the Beatles, as a percentage of their catalog, probably had more hits and you know as a percentage of their overall catalog. Right. Well, a sabermetrics guy could go back and actually figure it out. I think the Beatles are like the natural geniuses that you kind of look at. You think. Wow, that's incredible. I don't know how they did that. I could never be that, you know? It's like Elvis or something. It's mysterious. The Rolling Stones are people that had to work for it, and there's that too. So when you listen to their early records, they're kind of stumbling. You know, the Beatles are the Beatles instantly, I think. And some of those first records are some of their best records. Yeah. And then then also there's the fact that the Rolling Stones, the Beatles came to kind of hate each other and broke up. The Rolling Stones came to hate each other and stayed together. Right, so it created this mythology around the Beatles a little bit. Right. Well, they're like the going out. It's like, what do you like better? The athlete that goes out on top, you know, or the one that just is like Willie Mays who's playing for the Mets and is like, you know, trying to get on base. I even I wrote a long article for Ar- Harper's called In, Pra- In Praise of the Old Athlete because I always liked when athletes stayed about 10 years or five years too long because that's when they become human again and you can identify with them in all kinds of ways. And it's always interesting to find guys that can change their kind of game to figure out how to be relevant and contribute even when they're not this in their prime oh my gosh i totally want to ask you about that but there's there's so <laughs> many things i want to ask you about it okay let's start with that it seems like and you even kind of refer to this a little bit in the in the book uh it seems like most bands have their five-year run where they create great songs like the songs we all remember and then the next 30 years that's all we listen to is those those few hits from that five-year period the rolling stones I think you you probably like more Rolling Stones songs than the general public just because of your pure fascination with it, which we'll, we'll talk about also. But the Rolling Stones seem to have like an eight or nine year period of creating these unbelievable hits. But then they kept on composing songs for the next like 30 years, it seems, or 20 years or 10 years, however long it was. Those songs weren't as much hits. 
what what do you think it is that what what is the reinvention of the Rolling Stones? Like, how do they keep kind of staying on top? Well, it's a it's a sort of a bunch of issues. The first is. Um, if you look at like really creative people or bands, like a five-year period when most of the stuff happens, that's true. It's true of artists. It's true of filmmakers. Like who who has it been true for? So the Beatles obviously was sort of true for 1963 through 68. Well, it was true of Elvis Presley. Start with him. Yeah. You know he and then he went into there was a real marking point because he goes into the army. Right. And it's sort of like they cut his hair off and it never fully grows back in the same way, you kind of feel like, you know? And um, it's probably true of filmmakers. You know, you could sort of name names, but there's like a period where Francis Ford Coppola makes all those movies in a very short period of time. Uh, you know, he makes Apocalypse. Now he makes the first two Godfathers. He makes The Conversation. Best, and, book, best movie ever. Yeah. Conversation. Absolutely. And that's all like in five or six years. And, you know, you can look at certain painters. I don't know. There's some painters that have different eras of their career, and they're the exception. I mean, most of them have a great period. You know, you look at like Mark Chagall, for example, who became, by the time I was growing up, kind of a kitschy, you know, you didn't really take him that seriously, but you looked at him early in his career for about five years, he was like Elvis. So you know? why why is that, and how can an artist reinvent? So like, like Roy Lichtenstein's another example where he has kind of like that pop art re- re- uh, revolving around comic books. It's only like a three- or four-year period. I don't even know how long it was. And the stuff before and after, I don't really like that much. It just seems kind of average. That's just my opinion. Of course, maybe people will disagree. But how does someone reinvent? I mean, you've been writing now for... 20, 25 years or whatever. Like, how does an artist reinvent? I, well, the, one of the things that the Rolling Stones had was they had a manager, Andrew Lou Goldham, who said basically, if you want to continue as a rock band, you have to reinvent yourself every, I think he said five to seven years, because that's how long it takes a kid to go from being a sophomore in high school to being out in the workforce. And now you have a new sophomore in high school who wants his own band, doesn't want his big brother's band. You have to become a new band for that new sophomore. And as a result of that, the Rolling Stones have this fan base that's multi-generational because every five to seven years, they were a new band. And, you know, they remain the same but completely different. And how you do that, I think, in the Rolling Stones case specifically, is remaining incredibly open to influence. You know, so perpetual amateurs. It's like the Buddhist Mm. thing, you know, like always beginners. So at the beginning, they kind of were imitating, ripping off uh, blues, old blues, Chicago blues guys, where I come from, like guys like, you know, famously Chuck Berry, Muddy Waters, also like Little Walter and Jimmy Reed. And then in the 70s, they suddenly turn and they kind of get into reggae. And it's a whole new thing, you know. And then Mick Jagger goes to Studio 54 and discovers disco. And then suddenly they have this album that's like a fight between disco and the blues caught on vinyl, and that's... Some girls. And that's like their last great album because at a certain point they did stop reinventing themselves. And with the Stones, it's especially interesting because you mentioned the Beatles before. The Beatles would do this thing where they'd have they go away and they would have to each come in with a song when they did. So they'd have all these songs. And famously, George Harrison's songs didn't really get recorded. So we had these incredible albums after the Beatles broke up. Um, Ringo Starr's songs were kind of Yellow Submarine, I think, like the kind of silly songs. He did Get Back also? Yeah, he did some great songs, yeah. but he didn't do as many, and they were always a little different. The Rolling Stones weren't like that. They were Jagger and Richards truly collaborated, and they really wrote the songs with the band in the studio. And when you hear those, get into those songs, one of the things I got into the book is what's so great about those those great records, like Let It Bleed and uh, Sticky Fingers, and uh, they were hanging out. For hours and hours and hours. Yeah, you described it. They would be sitting around like in a circle on the floor. And even though they even then had tensions between them, like between Brian Jones and Mick Jagger and, and, and so on, they would all just, it seems like that's a, a particular skill that they had, which is that they threw all those personal tensions out when they were sitting on the floor like that and just coming up with the song. Yeah, or they somehow worked it through the music. And, this- and it seems like some of the songs, and sorry to interrupt, I, I'm an interrupter, some of the songs were very personal, like Mick Jagger would be fooling around with Keith Richards' girlfriend, but then they'd write a song about it, and then, no, no, I, would, I wouldn't be able to work with somebody after that happened, and, and they were doing it, they were putting songs together. Well, there's so many things about, you know, you wouldn't be able to work with them after that, I mean, then they continued on, Mo- like, Keith Richards' book, Life, how do they work together after that? Yeah. You know? and, but weirdly, anybody who's kind of a writer or done anything like that knows that when you feel really terrible about something, writing about it usually is a way to deal with it. Maybe. But they instinctively knew that, like, yeah. and, and knew that they had to kind of come together in the room and be creative. And they were, there was this whole soap opera, which is I, to me was a, their template as much as anything else for other bands, which is 
a rock band like properly is not just this got this great blues bass, but they got somebody who's addicted to something, and they've got this weird relationship between the lead singer and the guitar player that they love and hate each other, and they're like brothers. You know, it's like the thing in Spinal Tap gets it perfectly, where they both got sort of the herpes sores on matching spots in their lips, and, you know, they were making out sometime the night before. <laughs> yeah. You know, so, I mean, I, I and you get that with the Rolling Stones completely, and that's, you know, so when you hear a song like Waiting on a Friend, you just fill it in with their, their backstory, what makes it so incredibly great. And these songs, you know, they, like when you hear, I was just listening here, I was listening to, there's a George Harrison demos where he plays like, uh, While My Guitar Gently Weeps, and it's the same song. The Rolling Stones' early versions are completely different because, you know, the early satisfaction was like a folk song. Mm -hmm. And it slowly gets worked up because if you read about Duke Ellington, it's very similar. Everybody contributes in the studio. And Chris Kimsey, who is a producer, said to me, he produced some girls, I believe. He said, oh, he produced uh, Tattoo You. He said, you know, like a lot of bands come in with a song and they work on it. The Rolling Stones came with an idea and then went hunting for the song. Mm. And that led to all kinds of friction, too, because people felt their con- contributions, and I'm thinking of, like, Mick Taylor, to these, who is their guitar player who replaced Brian Jones, their contributions weren't fully acknowledged when every song was credited to Jagger slash Richards, which kind of stood for the whole band in a way. So, so again, and be- before we get into the nuts and bolts of the book, just reinvention for an artist in general. Like you mentioned, some artists have like, they keep, they have their different periods. Like Picasso obviously was a master of reinventing himself throughout his entire life. Um, but many artists and musicians and writers can't do it. And I'm even asking this for my own personal knowledge. Like, how does an artist reinvent? What should they do? And, and based on your experience from, for yourself and from studying the Stones and others. It's a bit mysterious, and I think probably one good way to keep reinventing yourself is not to be too successful, actually. Mm-hmm. So to feel like you're chasing something all the time that you almost can get but just can't quite get. But the Stones and Picasso obviously were incredibly successful in their first five-year period. They were, but Picasso remained, you got the thing that he remained pissed off. He mm-hmm. remained angry, you know. A lot of it's driven by this kind of, you know, and then also it's what goes on inside a person, but I think it's remaining, trying to remain open and willing to sort of be astonished by new things and be influenced. You know, the, the thing about the Rolling Stones, the reason why they were continually reinventing themselves in addition to needing to do that commercially is they were con- they had great taste. They, they, start with, they start as record collectors with the best taste. And they ripped off the best stuff, you know. And they were, continued to remain open to new music that could influence them. And really you see with Mick Jagger, when I was traveling around with them, I was young. Jagger was seemingly old. So this is like this is like twenty two years ago. You yeah. started your your relationship with the Rolling Stones is is vast. Like you were a fan as a child. You and I are the same age. You were a fan as a child in the seventies. Follow them through the eighties, but then suddenly you get this dream gig in I think it was nineteen ninety four from Rolling Stone magazine. Follow the Stones around for like the entire summer. Right. And and then here you are. 22 years later, not only you write this incredible book about them, but you also worked with Mick Jagger and Martin Scorsese on the co- concepts that are behind the HBO series Vinyl right now. Right. And... This must have been like a fantastic dream come true, the whole thing. It was, but it's sort of like you don't even realize how crazy it is as it's happening because you're just so badly trying not to screw it up. You know what I mean? Yeah. But what amazed me about, especially with the Vinyl thing, um, was now I was, tra- I was on the road with him working with him, and he's, um, I don't know, I'm like around 30 at the time. And we would go out and have dinner or whatever, go see a band. And then, you know, you go home. And he would go out. He was old. I mean, to me, he seemed old. He was in his 50s. And he would go out to dance clubs, wherever they were, uh, wherever the Stones were playing, mostly because he just wanted to see what was making kids dance on the dance floor. So it was just for him, kind of, he, obviously, he thinking of him as just a person with a job, he had the dream job. He could make a ton of money doing exactly what he loves, being creative, and it's 24 hours a day. It's totally the work-love thing blended right. completely. And think about it. Like as, a, like, as a writer, I think it's hugely important for me to read. Like, I read about five times more than I write. Right. And I try to read it. And if something's huge and people love it, I want to read it to see what the hell's going on. Figure out what is working, what I can steal, what I can use, what I can learn from. And I want to always go to young writers, you know, writers 20 years younger than me to see what they're doing. He's doing the same thing. But to do it, he's got to go to... 
a dance club. So is that part of reinvention? So the ability to always, again, it's kind of that beginner's mind thing you were referring to, always going back to what's what's hot from the kids 20 years ago. Right, and there's also a whole human thing where you don't take seriously anybody younger than you. I see with my, my father would always say, I'd say, this person said this, he'd go, how old is he? And I would tell him, ah, he was, he's a kid. And so, I'm, he's like 80 years old now. I'm like, listen, you're going to run out of people you can listen to because there's only like, a couple million of them left on the whole planet. You know, you're 83 years old. So, so I want to I want to address your dad for a second. So he's a he was a a, a businessman and he wrote this book. Uh, you can negotiate anything, um, and we're going to talk a little bit more about your family in a second. But he says in that book, you're better off with a great salesman uh, and a mediocre product. Do you ever feel the Rolling Stones at least initially started that way? Because Mick Jagger was such a great front man. He wasn't necessarily a musician in the beginning. I mean, I feel like he grew into it, but he maybe never became the best musician out there. And throughout your book, you even mentioned like people in the studio or people who performed with them would say, oh, they weren't like great musicians at all. It's just they had this, you know, enormous vibe to them. Right. Um, do you ever feel that was part, partly the Rolling Stones thing? Absolutely. Well, they had Andrew Lou Goldham, who had, was younger than them. He was like 18 or 19. His parents, when he signed his deal with the Rolling Stones as their manager, his parents had a co-sign because he was too young. Mm. And he had worked as a PR guy for the Beatles. And he had become sort of influenced by Brian Epstein. And um, he had very specific marketing ideas. And he sort of, his hero was Phil Spector at that time. Musically, but also like the way he sold the whole thing. And he really took the Rolling Stones in hand and he made a lot of changes. First of all, they were they started out as the Rolling Stones. He said, "Listen, if you can't be bothered to learn to spell your own name properly, who's going to buy your records?" They became the Rolling Stones. They had six members. He said, six members is too many. No one's going to care about six guys. You need to lose one. You should probably lose two, but you can lose one." And they got rid of one of their founding men- members, who was Ian Stewart, who was their piano player, because he didn't have the right look. But Ian Stewart stayed in the band, right? He stayed in the band. But it just wasn't like on a name Rolling Stone. Right. He, he he traveled with them. He advised them. They always considered him a member of the band, but no one knew who he was. He Did wasn't he make the money of, that they made? I don't think he made the money they made because the guys who really made the money were Jagger and Richards later because of the songwriting. That's where the real money was for yeah. a long time was in the publishing. So he didn't make the money, but neither did Mick Taylor didn't make the money either. And um, And so basically, and then at the beginning, he tried to make them the Beatles, you know, so... And every, everybody with the band was trying to make him the Beatles because the Beatles were a huge hit. So he dressed him up in matching houndstooth coats. He had him do press conference and try to look cute. And very quickly, he realized a couple things. One is they failed at that role. As Ke- Keith Richards has this great line, which is to me sounds like Huckleberry Finn, you know. He says, then the Rolling Stones thing would start to take over again. And I'd spill whiskey all over my jacket and get Charlie would get a big chocolate stain on his arm. We'd, someone would lose the coat somewhere, you know. But, but it's to your point of like, you know, Mick Jagger and Keith Richards, they even met on the on the, the train station, ho- both holding, or Mick Jagger was holding record albums of all these blues guys, and Keith Richards was like, what, what's that? They Their initial influences, they totally stole from. And even in their performances, you watch early footage of the Rolling Stones, Mick Jagger's totally what, going like Elvis Presley with right. the legs and everything. It seems like their whole act was kind of contrived almost from the past. Well, they start out as almost fans, Mm -hmm. you know, and it's interesting because they, somebody just sent me a picture this morning of, because they, Jagger and Richards knew each other, they were in grade school together. Right. A class picture from like second grade where they're both in the class picture. Then they separated because you take these big tests in England and they got put on different tracks and Jagger was like a upper middle class kid heading on the business guy track and he goes to London School of Economics and I say Keith Richards the kind of guy you know him in high school and he disappears and reappears 20 years later behind a pneumatic drill you know he was heading to some other life he ended up in art school which is what they did with the people in England at the time that would have once gone into the military now they got rid of the sort of military because they got rid of their empire I would say a side effect of losing the empire is rock and roll for England and that's um, so interesting yeah, I mean, they all these guys would have been sent to India or wherever. Instead, they're in little bars playing the blues. And ro- they were all very into rock and roll. And you could almost, like, start a movie with just uh, Heartbreak Hotel, which to them was the first Elvis song, even though he had songs before that here. But Heartbreak Hotel was a major r- release, RCA Records. They're all in bed all over England. They all hear it, like, the same night, played on Armed Forces Radio. And it completely blows them all away. And like anybody who's in the music, you know, you get into it and you fo- start following it back to its antecedents, and 
Rock and roll goes through this bad period where Buddy Holly dies, Elvis goes in the army, Jerry Lewis has his weird scandal, Chuck Berry goes to jail, and they all end up uh, getting into the blues, heard on Armed Forces Radio, and and you, but you can't get the records. The records aren't for sale. They're little tiny records made just for the black communities. They're, they're dance music made by guys like Leonard Chess. Chess Records, you know, Polish Jew, had a, was a garbage dealer, then owned a liquor store, and then started a record company. Because, you know, people are coming to the record, rec, a liquor store playing music. Mm. And, um, and basically, Jagger started sending away to Chess Records saying, I want records. And he accumulated this collection of these Chess Records. And he was holding those records on the Dartford train platform, ready to go into London, where he had class at the London School of Economics when Keith Richards happens up and doesn't notice, hey, this is a kid I knew when we were growing up. We haven't seen each other in a bunch of years. He notices, oh, my God, some guy's got a Muddy Waters record. I've never actually seen one. I've only heard about him. And he starts talking about the records, and out of that comes eventually the Rolling Stones. But it's they all, they're all starting as collectors with great taste. And at that point, Mick Jagger really didn't have any, I, I don't know if you can say talent, but he didn't have any musical skills. He didn't play an instrument, and he, 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 but he had this great voice, which I was told was as a result of him having an accident on the basketball court in gym. He bit through his tongue, mm. and after that, he was singing, and his voice was this completely weird thing that we know as Mick Jagger's voice. And um, he had was sort of a performer and sort of shameless. You know, his father was like a, a, a physical education guy and had a TV on the TV show on the BBC called like Getting Fit or something, and would use the young Michael Jagger as a kid on the show. So he'd had this experience. He'd actually been in front of cameras, and he would get up, and he could sort of imitate the voices of, you know, black guys from America, from Mississippi, which was a crazy thing to do, but he did it without any kind of self-consciousness or shame. And even every now and then, if you go look up Jagger, there's moments where he's still doing that, and it tips over into something that's awkward and uncomfortable. It becomes like a like minstrel almost. You know, there are <laughs> moments when that happens. Um, but usually it's this it's this... Elvis thing, you know, where he combined these different cultures and combined his own weird culture and came up with something that was new. So weirdly, he's trying to imitate his idols and in imitating them, he changes it because you can't help but do that when you imitate something and it becomes something new that the guy, when he came to Chicago, he played at Chess Records. He was so nervous. He's in a room like this. He turned his back. Because they were all looking at him. All those guys came, he thought, to kind of judge him. They came because they wanted him to record their songs because the royalties. Hmm. And they all came to pitch their songs. So in watching him was Willie Dixon, Chuck Berry, Muddy Waters. They're all sitting there watching him. So he had to turn his back and sing. And he was often doing covers of their songs. But they actually, not only did they approve, they actually recognized that this wasn't Pat Boone singing Tutti Frutti. This wasn't a whitened up version of a bl- of black music. It was actually something new and original that he had stumbled upon. And you even hear about, you know, when, when Howlin' Wolf went to England and he needed a band, I think he played with like the Yardbirds because they recognized that those guys were the best sort of blues bands around at that point. Um, and there, this connection happened that it's it's really interesting. So in the in the rise of the Rolling Stones, this is kind of their first period. The, it you, you the, it starts off with them as obsessive fans to the point where you know Mick Jagger is is writing you know this obscure record label in Chicago to get like whatever records he could get. Keith Richards sort of bonding with him despite class backgrounds, bonding with him over the music. So there's this initial obsessive fan phase. Then there's this imitative phase where they're going to try to imitate their teachers in a sense those become their their virtual mentors and then there's kind of performance but then there's also um you allude to community so even though the beatles in the beginning were sort of somewhat rivals john lennon and paul mccartney wrote the i don't think most people know wrote the rolling stones first major hit right well what happened is is the the rolling andrew lou golden realized that the stones weren't going to be the next beatles they were going to be the anti-beatles that the beatles by their popularity had opened a niche in the market as Keith Richards said, when the Beatles arrived, they were wearing the white hats. So what did that leave us? Left mm. us the black hats. So he started selling them that way. And his famous slogan was, would you let your mother marry a Rolling Stone? <laughs> and Jagger had this famous thing where he yelled, we'll piss anywhere we want, or we'll piss anywhere, man. And um, Tom Wolfe, you know, when the first came to New York, Tom Wolfe, who was writing for what became New York Magazine, wrote, uh, the Rolling Stones, uh, the Beatles want to hold your hand, the Rolling Stones want to burn down your town. And that was very you know, intentionally done. 
And now they needed their own songs because they had recorded the, the, these blues songs. And now Bob Dylan made it. You had to have your own songs. And they were having trouble. And Andrew Lou Golden went to Lennon and McCartney, and they wrote the first Rolling Stones song that wasn't a cover. I mean, it was an original written by Lennon and McCartney, and that was I Want to Be Your Man. And that's because they recognized what the Rolling Stones were before the Rolling Stones themselves recognized it. How did they do that? How did they recognize that? My father has this thing that always says, does a fish know it's in the water? You know, you can't see the world you're in because you're in it. They were a little bit outside. So they could see what you needed from the Rolling Stones. They could see it was going to be love from the Beatles and sex from the Rolling Stones and good from the Beatles and evil from the Rolling Stones. And the Rolling Stones followed that. I mean, if you look at their great songs, it's like Paint It Black, Play With Fire. Sympathy for the Sympathy Devil. Sympathy for the Devil. It goes all the way up to Altamont, kind of changes yeah. things. So the Beatles recognized it, and they wrote that first song in a weird way by writing that song and by Jagger and Richards watching Lennon and McCartney collaborate to write that song. Uh, they kind of taught the Rolling Stones how to write a Rolling Stones song. Isn't that amazing? Like, I didn't really know that, and I don't think that's common. I mean, it's not, obviously it's historical knowledge, but uh, I didn't really know that Lennon and McCartney kind of kicked off Richard's Jagger songwriting career. See, this is an advantage of me being younger than the guys who really wrote about the Rolling Stones and touring with them w- later on. It's sort of like I wasn't there in the crazy days of the 1970s or when they were having you know, when um, Robert Frank was making that movie whose title I'm probably not allowed to say. I don't know. Maybe I am because we're not on the, you know. So, but well, you anyway. Can say, you can say anything. You know, he made Cocksucker Blues and, yeah. and all that crap was going on. I missed all that. But what I got instead was distance and perspective. And I could see the, you could sort of see the whole picture. That's where you make the connections. And you sort of, even though it had been written before, you know, that Lennon and McCartney, factually, they wrote this song. People didn't really step back and say, what does that mean? You know, I mean, what does it mean that, that, that what did they, what actually happened there? Which was they set the template for the Rolling Stones song. Not only did they send the template, you have the best songwriting team in history in terms of like their impact culturally. And they essentially taught the Rolling Stones what to do. So it's not only, so now you see the Stones going from fans to imitators uh, with virtual mentors to having actual mentors from the two best songwriters on the planet at that time. Like, they had an incredible kind of head start over anybody else trying to do a band out of their garage. Right, and well, and and the Beatles got the Rolling Stones and loved the Rolling Stones. They're actually really close, I think. And very early on, the Rolling Stones were a bar band, and they were in this bar called The Crawdaddy, which was named after a Bo Diddley song. And the Beatles came to that show, and that was almost like anointing them. And then famously, it's like, I think it's Rock and Roll Summit. It's like Khrushchev meeting with Kennedy. They go back to the Rolling Stones' horrible apartment in Edith Grove, and they hang out all night drinking and comparing what musician do you like, what musician do you like. John Lennon's like, that one's good, that one's crap. you know. And I always had the feeling of Jagger had kind of a little brother relationship with John Lennon who kind of always held him a little bit at a distance, you know, like a friendly rival, but not always so friendly. Do you think John Lennon liked Mick Jagger? It doesn't seem like John Lennon would like Mick Jagger. Well, you know, John Lennon made these, one of his last interviews, I think was a Playboy interview, where he really ripped on the Rolling Stones. And at that point, it could be that the, see, one of the things, you're going through these stages about the Rolling Stones when they were imitative, when they were, and the big thing is at a certain point, it's like a writer, like at first you imitate other writers, and then, and then at some point you find your own thing. And the big point is the Rolling Stones found their own thing as the Beatles were breaking up and had this string of five great records that I think is greater than any collection of five great Beatles records. You know, it's almost like Mm -hmm. the Joe DiMaggio 54-game hitting streak. It's never going to be matched because to have five records of that caliber to the point where Tattoo You seems like a great record, and it's all outtakes from those five records. You know, so... The, the garbage from those sessions made one more great record just from the leftovers. Mm-hmm. And I think that he was a little bit jealous of that, John, uh, John Lennon. And weirdly, um, I, I think the Beatles breaking up liberated the Rolling Stones because they were always looking, I mean, looking at the Beatles like, what do we do next? And their biggest disaster professionally was sort of Satanic Majesty's request, which was their psychedelic album, which is almost a direct response to Sgt. Pepper's very soon after. And... You hear stories before John Lennon died, Mick Jagger and John Lennon were both living on the Upper West Side of Manhattan. And Jagger used to go by all the time, like to pop in on John Lennon. John Lennon was never there. He'd leave him notes. He'd never respond. That's so so funny. Yeah. (laughs) You know, so everybody's got somebody they want to hang out with that won't hang out with them no matter who you are. (laughs) 
Let's stop to take a quick break. We'll be right back. So obviously we're talking you wrote a book about the Rolling Stones, but I feel like this book unlike many books about other people or things or biographies or whatever, you are a major character in your own book here. And I mean, and it starts with you kind of hanging out with them. Like what, when you first are in the room with Mick Jagger, after you've followed him for your 20 years of your life, like what was, what was that experience like? You know, I've done a, like a lot of hanging out with celebrities. Like I've been a big celebrity profiler for Rolling Stone and for Vanity Fair. And there's only a couple that I, celebrities I'd ever met where the when you first meet them, they're cranking it all the way up to 11. You know what I mean? It's like the full-on rock star, dazzling thing. Like what? Like when? What does that mean, up to 11? <laughs> it means like they're giving you, like Mick Jagger, when I first met him, he was in a trailer outside of school where they were playing in Toronto. And I walked, they sat me down, and he was on the phone, and he was talking business. And he just seemed like this regular guy. It was like it was like a slow tone, like different kind of voice. Yeah, and quiet and kind of drab and gray and not colorful. Just like overhearing a guy talking on the train with his accountant, uh, you yeah. know. And then he hung up and he turned around and it was like he just threw a switch and he was Mick Jagger like in a stadium and gave me the full on, the smile, the way he talked. It's just Mick Jagger. It's like the biggest rock star in the world and it's sort of dazzling. So what what is that like? What what are, if you could break the, out the elements of charisma that he had that turned him into a rock star? What was that? Is it just confidence? Is it is it this stage persona? Like what what were the components of his charisma? Well, first of all, it's a weird thing when you have somebody that you've kind of been into since you're nine or ten years old. Mm -hmm. So every time you've seen him, you know, except going to a concert, seeing him in a big stadium, you've seen him like in two dimensions. <clears throat> now you see him in three dimensions, mm -hmm. and it's like going inside the TV set. That's why meeting a celebrity is such a big deal. You watch them go, from, it's like magic. That you can't believe they're real. They go from two dimensions to three dimensions. And they and these people with charisma, really intense charisma, it's even more. And a lot of people immediately recognize that and they try to put you at ease and say, hey, I'm a normal guy. Turn it down. So when you meet Keith Richards, he's like, hey, man, how you doing? Take a seat. What's going on? You know what I mean? You're like, oh, he's just just like us. You know, and Keith, Mick Jagger doesn't do that. He, you're not just like him. I mean, that's the message you get. He's of another order. That's the rock star thing. How does he do that? He does it by almost performing for you personally, you know, for doing all the things you expect Mick Jagger for do and for being. But what, what do you mean like that? What's like when you, when he turned on like right then, that first time you met him, when he turned on that Mick Jagger persona, what specifically made you think he's like beyond, like he's different from you and me? I don't know. It's just, it's his gestures and the way he carries himself and the distance that he holds himself away from you. Huh. Though very close, it's like he's still at a tremendous distance. And that gives everything. I have this whole philosophy where there was a guy I met once who was really kind of rude to me all the time. Famous guy? No, no, a guy in a magazine I worked for. Mm -hmm. And I finally said to him, what's your problem? What did I, I don't even know you. And he goes, oh, I know you. You're from Glen Cove, Long Island, and I know guys just like you. And I'm like, I'm not from Glen Cove, Long Island. I'm from Glen Cove, Illinois. <laughs> and you could see he's like, I don't know this guy at all. Like he had to completely readjust everything. Now, Glen Cove and Glen Cove, probably not that different. But he had me pegged as like somebody he grew up with who he was dismissive of and didn't like, and that was how he was going to treat me, and he moved on. And I just unpegged myself. Mostly when you meet somebody, and if you're a journalist writing about him, the easiest thing to do is to meet him and peg him. He's like this. He's like that. And then you move on. You're done thinking about it. Um, Mick Jagger does not let you peg him, and that's true of fans too. And the test I always give is, you know, you think about Keith Richards and imagine what he's doing right now, and you think you know, you can tell what he's doing right now. Probably playing guitar, smoking a joint, listening to reggae. And and you ask what, what Jagger's doing right now, people go, I have no idea. I cannot. He could be in a meeting with a bunch of bankers. He could be looking at Francis Bacon paintings to buy in Soho somewhere. You know, and that is his idea that the, the his way he becomes the rock star that he is, is he doesn't reveal himself, he hides himself. So he seems like he's exposed, but he's completely hidden. Mm -hmm. And that's what the really great, mysterious sort of rock star people do, like Madonna and um, Prince and David Bowie, you know, and that's why there's a hunt for pictures of them doing mundane things. Mm -hmm. 
You know, so I, if you wanted me to say what exactly he did, it's just his whole way of keeping himself at a remove. That's why writing the screenplay was so good for me as a writer, eventually writing this book, because I got to be with him in, in a slightly more relaxed so, so let, let's talk about that. So Martin Scorsese, Mick Jagger, they approach you about, this is many years before the HBO series Vinyl, but they approach you about doing something in the music business with them, like a movie at that time. Later on, it became, many, many years later, became ultimately what's now Vinyl on HBO. Uh, what was, that? that's obviously, the as it's even mentioned, the gig of a century, you getting to do that. So you're hanging out, with right. Martin Scorsese and Mick Jagger, learning you're learning from them the way you know they've learned from from others. What like Martin Scorsese, he would then have screen privately movies for you just so you would learn. What did what did you learn? Well, first of all, that's one where I really was super nervous. Like as I went for an interview, mm-hmm. I didn't know who else they were talking to, and they had talked about making this movie together ever since uh, Scorsese put Jumpin' Jack Flash in Mean Streets. That's how long they'd been talking about doing a movie about the music business or the music. And the meeting, the interview was at Scorsese's townhouse, which was like in the 60s on the east side. Big place? Yeah, he was like a mansion. Yeah. And, you know, big private house. And I had a, all of a sudden, like, I got to, I have to go to the bathroom. You know, like, I didn't know what to do. And there's nowhere, you know, New York, you can't find a bathroom. I can't go in there having to go to the bathroom. And I actually went, there's a movie theater on like 60th and Broadway. I went, or 60th and like 2nd, or I forget what it is, on the east side, right by the Queensboro Bridge. And I went, um, and I bought a ticket to the movies just to go in and use the bathroom. You know, like I needed to, uh, and I went in for this meeting, and what ha- it was a perfect collection. I'd written these stories about the Rolling Stones. I traveled with him, so I knew Jagger. He liked the stories. He remembered you? Yeah, it was right after. Mm. He trusted, and if he didn't remember me, he acted like he remembered me. Sometimes it's hard to tell the difference, but I'm, you know, I'd been with him a lot, not long before. And Scorsese, I'd just written my first book, which hadn't been published yet, which was Tough Jews. And Scorsese loved that book because the book was a lot like, Goodfellas, because I was heavily influenced by Goodfellas. And talking about the Rolling Stones imitating Muddy Waters, the the voice of that book wasn't really my voice yet. I always feel like it was almost the voice of Ray Liotta mm-hmm. narrating the story because that voice was so embedded in my head. So basically, you know, and Jagger's whole thing, like I said, like the distance, Scorsese's the opposite. You sit in a room with him, you immediately feel completely accepted and like he, you love him and he loves you. That was my and and you'd have meeting out of meetings with him last, you know, four or five hours where half the time he's talking about what we're working on, and half the time he's talking about uh movies and books and what should he read and what do I think of this and what do I think of that. There's a guy that's completely open to influence by younger people. And I was a, like who influences Scorsese right now? I don't know. I do remember that he was talking about the younger filmmakers then who were like, you know. The Cohen brothers were still, he considered them young. We don't consider yeah. them, but he would. Yeah. And um, like Paul Thomas Anderson, I think Boogie Nights hugely influenced by, uh, it, it more influenced than me by by Goodfellas. You know, mm-hmm. it's almost, some of it seems like a copy of Goodfellas. Mm-hmm. And um, he, what was amazing, I was around long enough that I watched him make from a distance several movies where, and one of the great things is like, one of the movie he made was a movie called Kundun about the Dalai Lama. Mm-hmm. And I actually got to watch him edit you know, with his editor. Uh, and it was the first time he'd ever edited not on film, on a computer. That was just fascinating. And then he would, like you said, he would think of movies and he'd go, oh, you should see that. Have you seen that? No, okay. And then I get a call a couple of days later, oh, Marty wants to, you know, schedule a screening, wants you to come see The Big Knife. And he had a screening room in his office and big movie theater, you sit there and watch this movie. So that to me was as instructive as anything. I mean, Jagger wasn't like that. Jagger was great. I would have to go meet Jagger on the road while they were touring, unless we met at Marty's house when he was in New York. But otherwise, if they were in Seattle, I would go to Seattle. And on their off day, I would sit and we would work on the script and he would tell me stories. And they weren't stories about the Rolling Stones. They were stories about people he met while being in the Rolling Stones. And would you were you doing this on spec or were they paying you a little salary? No, or? I think it was set up at that point at Disney. I, I'm pretty sure. And um, if I remember, and I think I was paid by Disney. Hmm. You know, and then it wound up somewhere else, and then other writers came on. But the whole thing lasted like it seems like we went on for ten years, and then it kind of was put aside for a while, and then it came back as vinyl. Why did it last so long? Like, were you writing pages at the time? Were you writing, coming up with story ideas? And yeah, well, you know, whatever. It was it kind of wasn't a great fit with Disney, honestly, because it was a nasty, dirty, right. drug-soaked. 
But Miramax, though, could have been a fit. And that was Miramax was under Disney's arm then. Right, but this was before that. Okay. So it was before Miramax. It was still the Weinstein's company. And um, and then, you know, we kept having to work on it, rewrite it. I think I wrote three or four versions myself. And then they brought in really good people for me to work with. And they wrote versions. And it was just, you know, and it's funny because when I first started working with Scorsese, he was just starting to make Gangs in New York. And he'd been working on it for 20 years. <laughs> he started working on it like in the 70s with Jay Cox. And I thought, oh, that poor bastard. And that's about how long it took, you know? So, so how did it eventually transform into vinyl, which is one of my favorite series on HBO now, so I'm just curious what your current involvement is. Well, what, ha- what happened is, is uh, Terrence Winter, who had made, there's another, he made Boardwalk Empire with Scorsese. And board, there's a, everything's connected, you know, because I was working with Scorsese when they first made The Sopranos, and they wanted Scorsese to do like a cameo. And anybody who watched the first season of The Sopranos knew The Sopranos was itself almost a riff on Goodfellas. What Goodfellas did was Francis Ford Coppola took the old-time 1950s mob movie and turned it into opera. And he lifted it up so high, at such a high level. And Goodfellas brought it back down to the street. Hmm. You know, the guys are kind of nasty little scumbags. I mean, you root for them, but these are low-level guys. And, um, And Sopranos picked that up and sort of played with that. And the first season, you know... Uh, they had a lot of guys who were in Goodfellas show up in The Sopranos. And there's all kinds of, and there's even a reference, I believe, in the first season to Tough Jews. Hmm. So, um, and then ultimately, out of The Sopranos comes Terrence Winter, who then works with Scorsese, and they make Boardwalk Empire, half of which is a lot like Tough Jews, because it's the same, a lot of the same stories about the Jewish gangsters in New York. Right, Rothstein, a big figure in Boardwalk Empire. Yeah, and Lansky, and Siegel, and all those guys, and um, and then ultimately Scorsese works with people, and he keeps working with them, and he brings Terrence Winter in and says, "What do we do with the script? We we're trying to get made." And the problem was <clears throat> that kind of big giant adult movie is hard to make now. A hundred and fifty million dollar budget on a three and a half hour movie, and Terrence Winter, I believe, said the way you do this now is television. So he took what had been our script, and he turned it into the pilot of vinyl. So, but for me, the, 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 one of the great things about vinyl was Jagger set up interviews for me with like the legendary guys who sort of started the music business who were still alive. And I went around for just about a year and a half just interviewing guys like Jerry Wexler and Ahmed Erdogan, you know, who, who Ahmed Erdogan started Atlantic Records and Jerry Wexler worked with Aretha Franklin and, and then, you know, was in working in Muscle Shoals, Alabama and was a partner with Ahmed Erdogan later and guys like High Weiss who famously would hold the guy out the window until he wrote the check that he was owed. And when I met him, he was an older guy living in Old Westbury, uh, Long Island. And, um, you know, just these characters, which who were actually a lot like the guys I interviewed for Tough Jews. And you really saw the crossover, you know, how it's really this, a version of the same world. But it seemed, you know, and and this is related. So I, I was also reading your book, Sweet and Low, about... Your 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 memoir of your family. So your family, your your grandfather, great grand, oh, back, way back in your family, you, you, you started experimenting with sugar and then artificial sweetener. Like your family created sweet and low, and then your arm of the family somehow got disinherited from that. My withered, tired arm. <laughs> yes, yeah, <laughs> the the withered arm of sweet and low got became you. And you mentioned earlier, kind of you be you change as an artist or become an artist almost out of anger. And you think this, you know, and, and yet then your fascination with kind of these tough Jews. I mean, so many of your books ha- are related to that. And your own family is sort of like a bunch of tough Jews. <laughs> like, did, did this sort of create your writing career? Well, I think that... Your, your curiosity about your own family yeah, and what definitely. happened. Yeah, definitely. Well, so when I, I... My father's from Bensonhurst, you know, and he... Get, I remember when Sammy the Bull Gravano's book came out, my father gave it to me and he'd annotated it. Huh. Like it was, you know, like it was Ulysses by James Joyce or something. So on every page, like, he'd circle a thing and then in the margins he'd write... Me and Hoo Ha and Gutter Rat hang out in this corner too. You know, we knew this guy's brother from the Y. You know, so um, <clears throat> anyway, so I, when I grew up, I grew up in Glencoe, Illinois, not Glencove, Long Island, and um, and it was kind of a very conservative, staid place. And my father, instead of telling me regular bedtime stories, would tell me stories about Abe Ellis, 
and Pittsburgh Phil Strauss and Happy Levine and Gangy Cohen and the gangsters of Brownsville. And, the, and it was, to me, it was so different than the Jewish parents I knew and all the parents I knew. They were like these blood-soaked bedtime stories, and I was always fascinated with them. <laughs> blood-soaked bedtime they stories. They were, and it was like this idea, like if you're Jewish, where I grew up, it's sort of like, you know, certain possibilities are foreclosed to you. It's like you're looked at and judged a certain way with a certain kind of stereotype. And the stereotype often wouldn't even be bad. It would be a good stereotype, but it's still a stereotype which kind of limits your freedom. And you wanted to, and I thought by writing about the gangsters, you kind of destroyed that stereotype in a way. And so that's what I was, I was interested in this idea of expanding the idea of what it means to be Jewish and making it more complete. And um, and also just the stories were so great. And there is a direct connection, which is Sweet and Low. My grandfather, before he invented Sweet and Low, invented the sugar packet. And he invented the soy sauce packet, which I only found out recently. Oh, I didn't know that. Yeah. You didn't mention that in the book. I, I didn't know think. it. Somebody was doing research, and they said, you know, your grandfather invented the soy sauce packet. And um, But it started out, he had a diner across from the Brooklyn Navy Yard. And the which diner— Which is now the hippest area of Brooklyn. Right. But then was military base. And his diner was across the street on the corner of Cumberland and Flatbush, and it was called the Cumberland Diner. And all the guys in the military base would come eat at the diner, and he had, like, this booming business enough that he moved his family to a house in Midwood, Brooklyn, which was, like, the suburbs. It was, like, really nice. And, um, and then when the war, World War II ended, all his business disappeared. And he— Why is that? Because the— Oh, because the, the Navy Yards were empty. The Navy Yard was empty. And he didn't know what to do, and he had some savings, and he had this went and he had to, when he was a little kid, he worked in a tea bagging factory, and he knew how to bag tea. So he took his money and he bought these tea bag machines, and he tr- changed the Cumberland Diner into the Cumberland Packing House. And if you look at the back of Sweet and Low, that's still what it says. It's a Cumberland Packing House, and he started packaging tea, but there was no one to buy his tea. There was no market for tea. It was a market well served. And there's a, it's a sort of a legendary story in my family. My grandmother and my grandfather, out of money, at the end of the rope, go to Cookie's Diner in Midwood, Brooklyn. And he's got his head in his hands, and he goes, what am I going to do? And my grandmother, who worked in the diner and had to go around cleaning off the sugar dispensers every day and thought they were disgusting and not sanitary because everyone was dipping their hands in the same bowl if it was a bowl or using the same dispenser, said, why don't you pack sugar? And he converted this tea bagging machine into a sugar packing machine. No one had done that before. No one had done it before. And he, oh, oh, it's a whole. How'd they get their first customers? Like, how'd they convince, how'd they educate the market that this would be a good thing? Well, what they did was, it's, he, he was a lawyer, actually. He'd gone to St. John's Law School, but he could never get a job as a lawyer. So you think he'd know better. But he basically went into Domino Sugar, which was the largest sugar refiner in the world and in Brooklyn, and he pitched them his sugar packets. And they had a big meeting, and they said, t- okay, two questions. First, how does it work? And he showed them how he did it and how it works. And they said, second, did you get a patent on this? And he hadn't gotten a patent. And they just made their own machines. Uh. But there were enough smaller sugar makers that, that didn't want to make their own machines that had him pack their sugar. So he had this very you know, successful packing company where he packed other people's sugar and started packing other stuff, which is how he invented the soy sauce packet. He packed fireworks. He packed coins. And um, ultimately, he always wanted his own product to pack it, and he was always on a diet, and he liked to put sugar on his, in his iced tea and watch it dissolve. And then if you didn't want to use sugar, all there were these little cyclamate pills, and he would crumble those up, and he said, why don't we have some version of artificial sugar that I can put in my iced tea? And he got together with a chemist, and he made all these different versions of fake sugar, which was saccharin, cream of tartar. And at this point, my father, who's grown up in Bensonhurst from a— his parents are immigrants, and they're not native English speakers, and they didn't go to high school, you know. And he's, like, from a different class. He shows up to pick my mother up on dates, and he said he'd get to that house in Brooklyn, and there'd be, like, 15 cups of coffee on the table, all sweetened with a slightly different version of the formula. So, see, it's interesting because it all comes out of a feeling of annoyance, right? So, there was, for 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 the, your grandmother... She didn't like the way sugar was coming out of the can, so she they came up with the sugar packet. So they were annoyed, and they came up with the sugar packet. With him, it's like he was annoyed that he couldn't really get the right sweetener that he wanted in in the dispense in the way and dispense it in the way he wanted. He was annoyed and created this business out of it. It's like sort of he's like the guy like why didn't anybody fix that? And he's actually would try to fix it. You know. Yeah. Also, the other thing is I always thought that it really Brooklyn was heavily immigrant, Eastern European immigrants at that time. 
and they were all trying to, they all thought they were fat because they were looking at advertising and they had, you know, my grandmother was like four foot nine and built like a tank, not that my other grandmother. And that's how a lot of them were built. And they wanted to be skinny and they wanted to be beautiful. And he thought it was just him. You know, he thought that he would sell his sweet and low to um, diabetics, to hospitals. And what happened is, is right after he started selling it to hospitals, people started stealing it from mm-hmm. hospitals. And then they started uh, calling the factory and asking if they could buy it in bulk. He, mm-hmm. he didn't realize there was this huge market. To me, it was always a lot like Chess Records. Leonard Chess didn't realize there was a big mainstream market for Chuck Berry. He was just trying to sell records to the community Chuck Berry came from. My grandfather ha- thought he thought that he was fat and he wanted to lose weight. And he was always on a diet. Well, it turned out like millions of other people felt the exact same way. And he plugged into this zeitgeist. And I always say that's really the story of my family, which is you take your basic, normal, mildly dysfunctional family from Brooklyn and add $100 million and watch what happens. Well, and then, and then <laughs> you guys, by you guys, I mean your mom on down, got completely disinherited from that, like 100%? Yes. And yeah. how, why, I... I have to say, I started sweet and low after I finished The Sun and the Moon and the Rolling Stones, so I haven't gotten to this point. Why did you get, uh, it, it, you were kind of alluding to it in the beginning, but I don't fully understand. How could it How could it happen that you got completely disinherited? It's, it's, it's so crazy. It's almost like everything was run through the business. So if you don't have the business, you don't get the big bulk of the money, and, but the business was everything. There was nothing but the business to the point that they were ultimately prosecuted for it, I think. So if they wanted... Work done on their house, guys came from the factory and did work on their house, you know, uh, kind of stuff you're not allowed to do. And um, ultimately, my grandfather's will was was set up so that the money, whoever died, it's common, whoever predeceased the other person, all the money went to the spouse. My grandfather died. My mother went into this, my grandmother went into this steep, steep depression after my grandfather died to the point that she had to be um, given these really hardcore drugs. Hmm. Or she what, like lithium. And she was living with my aunt, who's a whole other part of the story who probably came across. My Aunt Gladys, right. who was basically a shut-in, didn't leave her room for 50 years. She was not mentally healthy, okay? And she had this hatred of my mother. And I have little kids. You can see that there's rivalries. And if you let those things go, they can go completely off the rails. And between my, my aunt's hatred of my mother... And this uh, fantasy that she had that my mother had somehow stolen her life. Mm. And she was a sh- the fact that she was a shut-in was my mother's fault, which is insane. And she went to work on my grandmother, this is what I believe happened, to change that will, to have my mother completely written out of the will, and was successful and was f- abusing my grandmother at the time. And ultimately, you know, there was after the will came out, there was a thought that we should challenge it or not by me, my, my, my father and my brother and my mother. And I got on the phone with my mom, and I begged her not to challenge it because I thought that dedicating five years to that would completely destroy my mother, you know, and cause it was so hurtful for her. And I always have this thing, it's like a, from a gospel song, which is you can't wash your hands in muddy water. I mean, the situation was so ugly, you're never going to get clean by wading deeper into it. But but couldn't, like, like so your Uncle Marvin takes over the business, so I guess your mom's brother, and couldn't he have said, hey, let's just get back to the rational world, and of course, everybody should participate in the fruits of this business and, and work in it if they want and so on. Couldn't he have done the right thing? Well, to be completely fair, much later, after I wrote the book, um... My Uncle Marvin did attempt to do the right thing and to some extent did do the right thing, you know. Uh, that was later, though, like 15 years later hmm. or whatever it is And um, because people died. Basically, is what happened is everybody died, which is a lesson of everything. And the only ones really left are my mother and my uncle. And it's like being the two – when a family is like a country – and only the only people that really know the country are natives of that country. And he suddenly realized there's only two people left from this country, meaning there's only one person left in the world that really understands me and where I come from, and that's my sister, who I don't talk to anymore. You know, so he, so they reconciled, which was great because they reconciled just before my mother died, which was a complete bolt from the blue. You know, and that was one of the great lucky things that happened that they were able to reconcile before my mother died. Um, but nobody came forward and did the right thing. And I always thought a large part of it was because they were scared of my aunt. So so this is actually related to two points from the Rolling Stones book. Um, one is 
you know, you mentioned how Mick Jagger and, and Keith Richards had this riff, and they were almost like brothers. I mean, really, they were brothers. They kind of grew up together in this, creating this entire musical movement for t- over 20 years. And then in the 80s, they had the rift, and they've had constant rifts since then, like you mentioned, um, Keith Richards' book, Life. Do you think that's also something where, as you age, it's sort of like, ugh, I can't even deal with this problem anymore. I'm just going to keep on working with this guy who I love and have worked with for so long. I have think, such a history with. I think early on, it's like Mick became the designated driver of that band. Mm. And all these other bands of that era broke up, pretty much. They get back together for reunion tours, but no one continued all the way through. The Who didn't. The Kinks didn't. None of them did. Only the Rolling Stones. And the reason is because Jagger's so sober. I mean, and he's so clear-eyed. And he's like the parent of the band. So he's able to call up Keith Richards and say, listen, we go on tour one more time. We're going to make $100 million. We might as well do it. Something like that. And he's also able to say, you know what? Keith said what Keith said, and I'm not going to let it stop me from doing what I want to do. You know, so when when, I, when Life came out, I got an early, like, typescript of it because I reviewed it for Rolling Stone. And I knew them pretty well. And I read it, and I thought, okay, you'll, they'll never play together again. Because what Keith said about Mick, I would never be able to be on stage you know, with that guy again. Like what, what were some of the quotes from life? He talked about the size of his dick. I mean, that's pretty, you start there. I mean, that's it. You yeah. Know? He talked about how they had a pet name for him, which is they called him Brenda. And they would talk about him right in front of him, but he didn't know he was talking about him. They'd say, wow, Brenda's really on the rag today, isn't she? <laughs> you know? And it's almost like college level hazing. And, and even when I was with them, you know, when I was with them on the road, um, they would travel to and from shows in separate vehicles. There would be a, lo- a, cha- a long line of cars of their entourage after a show. They'd play their encore, run off the stage. Jagger would get in the first car, basically by himself, and the rest of the band would get in the second car. They didn't ride together, and they basically only met on stage. How, how, didn't the other guys complain about that? Like, what, I would be upset. Like, why is Mick Jagger going first when I'm the guitarist or whatever? I think what happened is, is in the late 80s, they signed, they negotiated this record contract, and Jagger, without telling the other guys in the band, had made a part of the deal that was just for solo Mick Jagger records. Mm. And when they found out, they felt hugely betrayed because it was like he'd used the Rolling Stones to cut his own deal apart from them. And then when his record came out, he went on tour for his own record and not on tour for the Rolling Stones record. Mm. And he played Rolling Stone records with other guitarists and other bands, Rolling Stone songs. And they basically broke up at that point. And Jagger's solo record didn't do well. You know, it did really poorly. And he sort of, and his Rupert Lowenstein, his money guy, basically said, listen, if you want to make the big money, that's there for the Rolling Stones. That's who people want. They don't want Mick Jagger or Keith Richards. They want Mick Jagger and Keith Richards. So they kind of got back together at that point almost by economic necessity. And after that, it's a different band. You know, because the realities of the world, they've been pr- brought back together by their limits. Do you know what I mean? And um, and basically, so when I was with them, that was after that. The first record after that was Steel Wheels. And it was like they were completely separate. And Jagger had a voice coach with him, which is fine. And you'd hear him going through scales before the show. And Keith Richards would be in his trailer with Ron Wood just laughing, snickering, and making fun of him. <laughs> you know? So you'd see it all the time. And like I said, they were together together on stage, hanging all over each other like they were the Glimmer Twins and best friends. And then as soon as the show ended, they were apart. Like, would they have dinner with their wives together right no, now? No, no. They, compl- they only met on stage. Imagine a relationship with somebody where you only meet them two hours a night on stage. That's what the relationship was like. Huh, that's funny. So, so uh, the other thing I wanted to mention about your reference to your mother is you have kind of an odd kind of out there reference to your mother in the book where you, you mention... Um, you're visiting where Keith Richards. You're kind of you're kind of revisiting. Well, let me take a step back. The, one of the keys to success of this book, I think, is the amount of research you put in. So, if Keith Richards lived in a house for a year in you know, France, you went 20 years later to visit, or 30 years later to visit that. 40 years later to visit right. that that house <laughs> for whatever reason, like which maybe you can explain. But then you, you, you mentioned you visited this one house he lived in in France, and just out, you throw it out there a month before your mother died. There doesn't really seem to be, like, why that context of, I mean, I, I appreciate the sentiment, but why did you put that line in there? Because I think that 
like one of the writers I I first loved. There's two writers I really loved when I first decided to become like a nonfiction writer. One was I worked. I was a receptionist at the New Yorker and a Messenger, and um, somebody handed me a Joseph Mitchell story. And what I loved about Joseph Mitchell was he was not in those stories. I mean, he was. I mean, he was the first person, but the stories weren't about him. And yet they were completely about him. I mean, that's all they were about. And behind every word choice, you got a sense of who he was. And the other writer that really kind of blew me away was Ian Frazier, who really took what Joseph Mitchell did and made it a more explicit, you know. So he had wrote a story about the Russian painters Komar and Melamed, and his lead for that was two guys I really wanted to like me very much were Komar and Melamed. And that's usually if you're writing about somebody who you admire, that is how the story begins. You're going and thinking, gosh, I hope they think I'm cool. So, so it's this real kind of... Ultimately, every story is about the writer, whether he mentions himself or not. And there's a kind of certain honesty towards saying, like, oh, I really wish they like me. Right. That's a great way to start a story. And it's completely explicit, and it says it's true. Mm -hmm. You know, and it's interesting, and it's human. And the thing with my mother is, okay, so I went on these trips, and I think back on it, and the first thing that comes to me is my, my mother's death. And maybe that's just the way everybody is. I mean, that thing like your mother, like the death of a of somebody, like a parent, it's like losing your virginity. It's like you, the world completely changes. And so, so perhaps then, so obviously, this whole time period was colored by the death of your mother, but also it also kind of underlines the importance of this research you were doing. Like here, your mother must have been sick or something. It must have been on your mind, and yet you're going around the world to visit a house that Keith Richards hasn't even been to in forty years. Why did you go to that house? Well, I feel like, you know, it's so much easier and so much better to write about a place that you've actually seen. Mm. Even if it's 40 years later, you get a sense of what the country looks like, what the house looks like. You kind of feel the vibes of the place, not to be cheesy, but you do. You get a sense of it. And you get a sense of what's not the same and what you imagine compared to what really is. And then also, you don't know what's going to happen. You know, so stuff happens when you go when you get out of your house and go places, stuff happens. And to be completely honest, one of the if when I was young and deciding what I wanted to do, one of the reasons I wanted to be a writer was because I wanted to do stuff, man. I wanted to travel. I wanted to meet people. I wanted to go places. And this is one of the great things about being the kind of writer I am. It's not the highest paid. It's not, you know, this, that, and the other. But I get to go to the south of France and see where the Rolling Stones made Exile on Main Street. And you might run a private equity fund, and you're not doing that, you know? And I am doing it. And that is just, and I thought at one point, because like I said, the Rolling Stones have great taste. They had great taste in music. They have great taste in art. They also had great taste in places. And I thought, wow, this could be a travel book. I mean, if you just go to all the places that were important to them, you're going to the best places in the world, you know? You're going to... That might be interesting, by the way, in terms of marketing this book, you should write, like, for some big website, kind of the the travel guide of the Rolling Stones. Yeah, that is a good idea. I mean, I thought about that at the time because you got, you know... You got south of France, you got Paris, you got these neighborhoods in Chelsea and London, you got New York, you got um, Andy Warhol's estate on Montauk. And uh, doesn't Keith Richards live in Westchester County now? He lives in in, a couple miles from where I live in. He lives in Weston, Connecticut, in a beautiful, beautiful place. And you have, um, they also spent all that time in North Africa, you know? So they were in the right places at the right time. Yeah. So, so, So it's interesting. So... Uh, you know, the other thing I get from that, putting yourself in the book itself, it reminds me a little of Norman Mailer and some of his books, uh, like The Fight, where he writes about Ma- Muhammad Ali, George Foreman, where he actually, go- he's going there, but he's really, he's always referring to himself as the writer, or he's referring to himself as in the third person. And I feel there's like a little bit of ego in his stuff, but there wasn't that in your... Well, because Norman Mailer made himself the character. Like, he's Aquarius, like the main character. And it's interesting, but it's almost like what I like is... And, you know, some people don't like it, and it's jarring, and people, you know, they people basically want what they've already read. So if they never read a book like mine, which isn't a straight history, it's a different, different kind of thing, but it can be jarred by it. But what I always like reading is quick shifts in perspective. It's like you're in a city, and if you could suddenly see the city from 50 miles away, you know, you get a sense of where you are. Like, to, like what do you mean? I don't understand. Well, like mentioning my mother's death. Mm-hmm. It's sort of like, oh, somebody's writing this who's got his own personal crap going on. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? Like suddenly I get a glimpse of the artist painting the painting. It gives you a sense of the reality and the unreality of it and the fact that this, this music is so interior that we date our lives by it. You know, I was listening to this before my mother died. I was listening to this after my mother died. 
this song, like I remember when my first serious girlfriend and I broke up, the radio was just on as we were breaking up, and this Chuck Mangione song, Feels So Good, came on the radio. And I thought, oh, crap. Now, every time I hear th- this song is going to become an important song in my life, and I have no choice. You know, there was enough of a distance to realize that. So, and I, but like, you know, one of the things about shifts in perspective is I had different time periods going on. So I'm writing about the Stones in the early to mid 60s, and suddenly I shift to I'm with them in the 90s. It's a 30 year jump. And you're hoping that it doesn't seem jarring but it's suddenly you suddenly are with a young man and you get a picture of him as an old man and you it's it gives you kind of another angle and gives you kind of a depth well well it, it's interesting because there's already been so many books about the rolling stones and and just straight biographies of mick jagger and keith richards and so on that like i for instance already knew all these stories about the rolling stones so to just read about altamont again or their big drug bust and and all these things wasn't that interesting to me because i've already read about it and all the kind of police analysis and so on but to have a new character in that your interactions with them makes this book particularly interesting like tell tell us the story of the title oh well the sun so the sun and the, the, moon, the moon and the, and the rolling well, stones to me the title is the whole book in a way because the, the the way i came to this music is my brother when he was about 15 moved into the attic and locked the door to me and i would hear this great music coming down the stairs, but I wasn't allowed upstairs. And my favorite, first favorite song was Rhinestone Cowboy by Glenn Campbell. I remember lying in bed listening to it, and suddenly I heard the cowbell from Honky Tonk Women. And it was like, my music got blown away. And I was standing at the door, like with my ear to the door listening. And that's always been my perspective. And when I got to meet them, I was like, I felt still in the position of the little brother with these guys. And um, Keith Richards, I was interviewing him the first time, and he started to be taken by the questions I was asking. And he stopped and he said, hey, wait a second, what year were you born? And I said, 1968, which is, you know, right in the middle of the Rolling Stones career. And he started to laugh and he said, you should be answering my questions. You know, what's it like? I don't know. For you, the Rolling Stones were always there. For you, there's always been the sun and the moon and the Rolling Stones. And that really is the perspective of it. And, you know, it's interesting. It's like you talk about you know, the stories have been told before. What's new there? I think I think for me, like as a writer, it's like the like when I first worked at Rolling Stone, very young, forget for all the bands, the whole thing that the Rolling Stone was going to give you was access. We're going to take you behind the scenes. We're going to show you stuff you can't see. The internet killed all that. Access isn't the, it's, I always think the crisis for nonfiction writing, there has been a crisis unacknowledged, which is like similar what painters faced when photography came in. Like, here's something that, you know, everyone's got a phone. They're filming this stuff all the time. What does a nonfiction writer have to give? And what they have to give is not just a sense of what happened, but of what it felt like and what it meant and where it fits into the whole big picture of our society. Because the Rolling Stones were bigger. I I saw this as sort of the history of the life and death of rock and roll, the obituary of rock and roll, because I think rock and roll died. You know, and I think the Rolling Stones were the greatest rock and roll band. And if you tell their stories, you tell a big chunk of American history. And you'll notice my other books, I'm not a music writer, especially. I'm just a writer. And I'm interested like in American history and in popular American history. And to me, this this is a whole era of American history. It's about how a part of black culture goes to England, gets stripped of all racial context, comes back and does exactly what the parents thought it would do, which is it causes everybody to grow their hair long, stop going to school, take drugs, and go completely insane. And we're still living in the aftermath of that because those baby boomers are now the old people in our country, and we're still living in their world. But what's going to happen? Like, So on my way here, I asked my 14-year-old daughter, have you ever once in your life listened to the Rolling Stones? And for a second, she had to kind of wonder who the Rolling Stones were, and then she was like, no. And, but uh, she has. She just doesn't know it because if she listened to the Hilton commercial, right. she's yeah, heard just satisfaction. Came out. I mean, yeah. they're kind of so everywhere. And every movie, it seems like there's at the climactic moment, Give Me Shelter comes on or something. Right. So they've kind of become so successful that their distinction is gone. And even though young people don't really know who they are, they absolutely know who they are because they're living in a world created by them. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, and and what now, other than money, you think? I mean, they're, I think they're on tour right now. Like, What keeps them going? Well, Keith Richards, because when I was with, when I first met them in 1994, this was the same question. The press was calling him the the, the Geritol tour, yeah. calling him the Strolling Bones. They were 52 years old. 
Right, only okay. a little older than you and I are right now. Right, exactly. So, and I asked Keith Richards this several times, like, because it was, why do you keep doing this? And he, to the point that he got kind of annoyed, you know? Uh, and he finally said, listen, this music only exists when it's in front of a live audience, okay? And you can play it in a studio. Like John Lennon said, we've come to the end of the road. Keith Richards says there is no end of the road, you know? Their models are guys like Muddy Waters who played till they had to literally put them in a box and bury them in the ground, you know? So um, I think that they do it, yeah, there's the money. I mean, the money don't you know, dismiss the money because it's a lot of money and they have big lives and they spend a lot of money. But there's also the fact that this is what they do. They make this music. They're rock and roll band. And the rock and the rock and roll band is only a rock and roll band, according to Keith. It's like um Brigadoon, man. It only exists when they're playing in front of an audience. Now the question I always ask them is, well, why not go and do what Elvis Costello did, you know, and go to the beacon and play in front of a much smaller audience where you can really see how great you are because the fact is musically now they're probably better than they've ever been which is what happens when you get older which is you lose that sort of magic thing and, and in return you get kind of a competence maybe you didn't have when mm -hmm. you were young professionalism and um uh because one of the great things is when i was on tour with them before they went on the tour they played a pop-up gig at a little band in toronto and when i went off to college in new orleans i started seeing bars bands in bars and i'm like i will never see another band in a stadium because this is where it lives like so much of it is the mosh pit and being smashed together with other people and kind of losing your mind and seeing the band play till three four in the morning and you know and the rolling stones were so far from that and when i saw them in this little bar i was like oh so this is what they really are they're a bar band they're the band who played in the crawdaddy they're the band who everybody who saw decided to start a band before the Velvet Underground. You know, they're the original greatest rock and roll band. They're the Sex Pistols. They're the Clash. They're every one of those bands times two or three. They're the greatest bar band in the history of music, and nobody sees them in their natural habitat anymore, which is a bar. And they'll just say the demand is too great and we can't do it. But to me, what the Rolling Stones should do now is they should put out a record that is their first. We have the set list of their first show together. Record that as a record and go on a tour of bars. That's a great idea. Yeah. <laughs> so, so I wanna, I wanna just one more time get back to the Martin Scorsese thing, just because I appreciate this as as a writer myself. What's what's like the one takeaway you get from all the time you spent with Martin Scorsese and Mick Jagger, thinking about writing and storytelling and so on? Where, what does Martin Scorsese bring to you as a storyteller? I think the thing that Scorsese did, probably because he's a filmmaker, is um, first of all, the fact that just like Jagger, he starts as a movie fanatic and he sees 10 times more movies than he makes mm -hmm. and he sees everything. But second of all, the idea of how important what you see visually and even unconsciously is the stuff that maybe you gloss over, but it's in your brain. Like what? Well, like in my book, like saying before my mother died, yeah. somebody might go, what is this? But it, it puts you somewhere in the, you know, where the writer is emotionally in some way. You know, in Scorsese, there's a scene, it's in every one of his movies, he's, there's so much is going on in the background of his movies. So I always think of this scene where there's two guys talking in the foreground in a social club in Brooklyn, and in the background, a bunch of guys are opening a box, putting on yellow sweaters that have clearly been stolen. You know, and you see the kind of multiple levels. Another one is, there's a great scene in Goodfellas where, and you see it imitated all the time, Ray Liotta and Robert De Niro are talking in a diner, and Ray Liotta's starting to freak out because he thinks they're going to kill him. And the camera, uh, there's a close-up. The camera zooms in, but in the background, it zooms out. Mm. You know what I mean? And it's this effect that your brain, you don't even know what's happening, but your brain registers it. And that's the kind of thing, I always think the difference between movies and writing, in a way, is writing works from the inside out, and movies work are all about surface, and they got to go from the outside in. So Scorsese is always trying to get inside his characters. Because it doesn't, the film doesn't naturally do that. That's why he always has the voiceover, hmm. you know. And in writing, you're trying to get almost outside because you naturally start inside. Literally, someone's reading your book and you're inside their head. And how do you get out? Well, Rich Cohen, author of The Sun, The Moon, and The Rolling Stones, great book. I thoroughly enjoyed it. But people should also read Tough Jews, Sweet and Low. Um, I always forget the name of the the guy from the United. Fish that ate the whale. Yeah, uh, <laughs> not only a great book, 
But Ryan Holiday, who first mentioned The Sun and the Moon and The Rolling Stones to me, uh, told that's like his favorite book of all time, and he's been a regular guest on this podcast. He's probably personally sold 10,000 copies of that book right yeah, now. Yeah, it's so funny. He, was, you, he was like, we, we did a podcast here, and then we had dinner next door, and he was like, oh, listen, you've got to read The Sun and the Moon and The Rolling Stones. And he explained <laughs> to me the, the title, and he's like, you got to meet Rich Cohen, Tough Jews. And I'm like, oh, yeah, I've read Tough Jews. And, um, uh, and then I started reading The Sun and the Moon and The Rolling Stones, right before I was going to meet my friend A.J. Jacobs for a book reading. And then after that book reading, he's like, oh, I got to go to another book reading. It's all the way uptown. you want to go? And I'm like, oh, I don't want to go uptown. He's like, no, it's, um, it's this book lunch party for this guy, Rich Cohen. You know who he is? And I'm like, oh, right before I went to meet you, I was just reading this, Sun and the Moon and the Rolling Stones. <laughs> so it's all kind of worked out that now you're here. In the, so you're in this city. everything's connected. Yeah, everything's connected. <laughs> Particularly along like, uh, well, I can't say Ryan Holiday's a New York Jew. He's the exact opposite. So, <laughs> um, But anyway, thanks a lot, Rich. Thanks for coming on the podcast. Thanks so much. For more from James, check out The James Altucher Show on the Choose Yourself Network at jamesaltucher.com and get yourself on the free insiders list today. Hey, thanks for listening and supporting my podcast. I just want to let you know I have a new episode for you every Tuesday. And in fact, I'm thinking of adding more episodes per week. If you subscribe, you'll never miss one. It's really easy and it helps me a lot. Just go to iTunes, search for The James Altucher Show, and click subscribe. Thank you so much. I really hope you do this. I created this idea called Generation W. It's all about educating, inspiring, connecting women. And it's about building community at the same time. It's not like women are on some outpost somewhere, right? Just like you no know, ethnic people are on some outpost there, people of color, right? We're all together. So if we learn how to appreciate each other, we elevate one and we elevate us all. And so for the first year, we just, that's where we started. And we had 700 people show up. They had no idea what they were showing up to, but they loved it. And they said, we want more. 